Hola, ¿cómo están? Soy Patricia Gómez. Bienvenidos. Hoy en adelante, una exhibición del Instituto de Arte de Chicago sobre el taller de la gráfica popular. También 19 países son representados en el segundo carnaval latino. Y el abogado en inmigración, Joseph Rivas, nos habla del programa de acción diferida. En el año 1937 nació el Taller Mexicano de la Gráfica Popular en la Ciudad de México. Este taller surgió y evolucionó a raíz de la política antifascista y de izquierda de México en el periodo que rodea la Segunda Guerra Mundial. El Instituto de Arte de Chicago presenta una exhibición denominada What May Come, que incluye más de 100 obras que demuestran por qué el taller de gráfica influenció al mundo e inspiró a la creación de colectivo de impresión. Nosotros visitamos la exhibición y nuestro productor Johnny Muñoz nos trae la historia. The title What May Come is taken from an important print in the Art Institute collection that was created specially by Leopoldo Mendez for the Art Institute of Chicago. He actually carved a wood block as a special commission made by the Print and Drawing Club of the Art Institute. This was created in 1945 and shows a self-portrait of the artist uh, lying on an open sketchbook with uh, a nightmarish vision of the future of Mexico arrayed behind him. This work was commissioned, as I said, by the Print and Drawing Club and it was made specifically for a large solo exhibition by Mendez that was uh, organized by the Art Institute of Chicago in 1945. This exhibition was one of three exhibitions during the mid-1940s that the Art Institute organized on Mexican art, the first one being a very large show of 800 works by the Mexican broadside illustrator Jose Guadalupe Posada, the Mendez show I just mentioned in 1945, and then a very large group show of the work of the Taller de Gráfica Popular uh, held in 1946. So this exhibition really brings together prints and some drawings from our permanent collection produced by many different members of the Taller de Gráfica Popular. And we're now able to show them and bring attention to this important part of our collection that really deserves to be better known. Leopoldo Mendez is probably the most important printmaker to work with the Taller de Gráfica Popular. He was one of the co-founders of the group in 1937 and perhaps the most adept artist who worked with the group. He was a master of uh, relief printmaking techniques. So techniques like wood engraving, wood cut, line of cut, uh, but he was also a fabulous uh, lithographer as well. He's really one of the individuals who pushed forward the ideals of the Taller as a, a collective of artists who worked together, who collaborated to um, produce a very wide range of works, not only uh, politically engaged prints, uh, hojas volantes, broadsides that were sold for a few pennies on the street and uh, took as their real model the works of Jose Guadalupe Posada, but also fine art prints in all these different media that were uh, sold to collectors and museums on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border as well as uh, elsewhere internationally. This exhibition is a wonderful opportunity for us to present more than 100 works from our permanent collection, many of which have not been on view in our galleries since the time they were acquired in the 1940s. The Art Institute of Chicago, as you may know, was a leader in establishing relationships with Mexico and developing a cultural exchange with the Mexican government specifically. Our interest in the arts of Mexico and specifically in printmaking in Mexico dates back to the 1930s and 40s when these relationships were established and when curators from the Art Institute began to acquire these works for our collection. In the early part of the 20th century, um, curators affiliated with the Art Institute and even our director, Daniel Catton-Rich, had a specific interest in Mexico, in part because of um, wonderful Mexican culture, but also because of the political situation at the beginnings of World War II. So one curator from the Art Institute named Catherine Koo had a specific 
connection to Mexico. She herself traveled to San Miguel de Allende and her companion was originally from Guatemala. So she had personal connections to Mexico and that then enhanced the institutional relationship to the Mexican government and then specifically to the Taller de Gráfica Popular. The Taller de Gráfica Popular was an artist collective founded in 1937 by three founding members, um, Leopoldo Mendes, uh, Luis Arenal, and Pablo O'Higgins, who was actually born in the United States and then became a Mexican national. These founding members developed the Taller into a center for printmaking that produced prints with a political commitment, um, prints that also just documented daily life in Mexico, prints that commented on social injustice, and also prints that were just beautiful and really meant to be visually pleasing. Luis Arenal and Pablo O'Higgins were two of the co-founders of the Taller de Gráfica Popular, along with Leopoldo Méndez. O'Higgins is an interesting character. He grew up on the west coast of the United States, uh, studied art there, but then was drawn to Mexico in the period after the Mexican Revolution, so in the 1920s, in order to study with the great Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. He studied with Rivera, but became uh, very interested in printmaking, in fact, was considered really the master lithographer of this group. What's wonderful about this exhibition is that it really gives an overview of many different types of printmaking. The Taller de Gráfica Popular was a center for printmaking and was a place for collaboration involving different types of printmaking, such as lithographs, such as linocuts, such as wood engravings and woodcuts. And some of these artists worked in different media. So people can expect to have an introduction to printmaking, why prints are so special, an introduction to the many different artists who participated in the work of the taller, specifically to one of the founding members, Leopoldo Mendes, who is very well represented in our collection and really shows all these different types of prints to their greatest advantage. This exhibition includes almost 125 works from the permanent collection of the Art Institute, both the Prints and Drawings collection as well as the Ryerson Library collection, the Ryerson Library being the Art Institute's um, very fine art library. These range from uh, fine art prints, uh, fine art portfolios, illustrated books, uh, uh, flyers, uh, broadsides and posters as well, what may come. This was actually printed from the original block that Mendez provided to the Art Institute. The prints were, the impressions were actually made by Max Kahn here in Chicago once the block arrived here. So there were many uh, rich interactions between uh, this group in Mexico City and the artists who collaborated with them, whether they stayed in Mexico or whether they uh, actually returned to their home countries and continued to produce work that was deeply influenced by the taller. We've continued to add to the collection over the years um, to grow it from that initial core of about 200 objects to um, almost 500 objects, actually, if we count the library's collections as well. Work of an exhibition is parallel to the work of Taller, which is a work of collaboration. So many different departments at the Art Institute contributed to this project. Our publications department helped us to produce our beautiful bilingual catalog that includes many um, full color reproductions of works from our collection also in the exhibition. Our design team helped us with the graphics and also to design the bilingual label treatment that we are so pleased to include in the project. We also worked with members of our paper conservation department to give more attention to this important part of our collection that in some cases needed some extra care um, or some extra treatments to really make them look as good as possible. More importantly, I think that uh, not only the kinds of works but the themes that these artists treat um, are an important aspect of how I've tried to organize this exhibition. It's organized thematically um, 
drawing on the, the different subjects that these, that these works treat. So the section that we're standing in now is devoted to anti-fascism and the war, anti-fascism being the central focus of this collective in terms of their political art making from their founding in 1937 through the end of World War II in 1944. There are also sections on Mexican life, Mexican daily life, another section on history and nation, a uh, fourth section on caricature in the press. And then we have um, a long room that treats um, not only the publishing arm of the Taller de Grafica Popular, the Estampa Mexicana, which is founded in 1942 and produced both, both portfolios and illustrated books, but also a section that treats the deep connections between the Taller and Chicago. It was a pleasure to work on this exhibition with Diane Miliotis, our guest curator. I helped her through the phases of the project to make sure that we were collaborating with the different departments within the museum to um, participate in our collaboration with our local constituents, such as the National Museum for Mexican Art, the Cat Center for Mexican Studies at the University of Chicago, and other um, and other collectors and museums who also hold this important material in their permanent collections. In uh, 1925, Ramirez left Mexico in order to come to the United States and get work simply to send money back home. So this is a story that while that was 80 years ago for Ramirez, this is a very common story in our culture today. The Milwaukee Art Museum came to Harley-Davidson a few months ago telling us about the exhibit. Harley-Davidson Board of Directors, Foundation Board of Directors looked at the project, thought it was great for Milwaukee, great for the uh, Hispanic community um, to, to have the culture uh, experienced and so that people really know what the Mexican culture is and the lives of Ramirez. El pasado 26 de julio se llevó a cabo el segundo Carnaval Latino de Milwaukee, un evento que contó con la participación de cerca de 19 países latinoamericanos y del Caribe, representando su cultura y sus tradiciones. Este carnaval tiene como objetivo mostrar la gran diversidad de música y costumbres que tenemos en toda la América Latina. Pero veamos este reportaje de Johnny Muñoz. <risa> El mensaje que se tiene es de que todos, aunque somos latinos, ten, venimos de diferentes culturas y diferentes experiencias. ¿Verdad? Entre un, un mexicano le gustan las tortillas, el peruano no sabe lo que es una tortilla. Creo que es importante que Estados Unidos sepa que cada uno de nosotros de los latinos venimos de diferentes culturas y aportamos muchas cosas diferentes a la integración y a la fábrica de lo que es Estados Unidos de Norteamérica. This year and last year we represented Cuba and we did a program that we call La Gran Rueda. It's a program with adults where we get as many adults together as we can to dance a Cuban style of salsa, which is danced in the round or in a circle. Esta fue una idea que salió una, un, tomándonos un cafecito entre Julio Pavón, yo, uh, Jaime Bernabé y el dueño de la warehouse donde queríamos organizar algo que unifique a nuestra comunidad latina en una forma bien sencilla y sin crear muchas enemistades. I think it's really important for children to be exposed to different cultures, whether they are from that country or not. So I feel that the Milwaukee Latino Carnival allows teachers to go into the schools and expose them to a dance they might never have seen, it might be something different, but they're able to connect the name of a country, 
a Spanish speaking country, maybe they know somebody from there, and now they're they're getting a, a much richer experience. Se está incrementando mucho la participación de los jóvenes de la joven de la juventud dentro del folclore de su país. Esa es una gran victoria para nosotros saber que nuestros jóvenes y miembros de otras comunidades están aprendiendo nuestras culturas de los 19 diferentes países que participaron en la parada este año. Yo creo que hemos excedido nuestras expectativas, Estamos eh, hasta ahorita tenemos el triple de número de gente que ha llegado el año pasado, tenemos mucha más, muchos más patrocinadores, uh, el, yo creo que hemos doblado el número de gente que participaron en la parada el año pasado, eso fue algo muy bonito. Somos parte del grupo Meyocan y este grupo representa una celebración entre la dualidad de la vida y entre los hombres, las mujeres. Este tipo de danzas fueron preservadas en lo que se llamó tradición oral. Fue pasada de generación en generación por familias hasta nuestra época, época actual. Cada danza representa lo que es más que nada los elementos de la naturaleza, ya que cada danza que se hacía llevaba la representación de los que llamaban los cuatro elementos generadores de la vida, que era agua, tierra, aire y fuego. Todos los chinelos de Morelos, de Cuernavaca, Morelos, te invitamos. Es una tradición, un carnaval que se hace cada año. Este baile se va, este grupo se hace cada año en tiempo de abril, mayo, son los carnavales para México. Todo lo de Cuernavaca, Cuauhtla, Tlayacapa. Es una tradición, es un gusto que se celebra. Tres, cuatro días son de fiesta. Es con banda, es banda y son tres días. Nuestro trabajo más grande es tratar de conseguir los fondos para poder pagar a los maestros, a los bailarines, a los danzantes, a los, a los que tocan música, para poder pagar los, los seguros y todo lo que se trae, porque es un costo muy grande. Entonces, eh, ese más, es, yo creo que este año hemos, hemos superado un poquito más, porque ya es nuestro segundo año, y esperamos pues, que el próximo año podamos contar con el patrocinio de muchas más personas y la colaboración de muchos más miembros de la comunidad. <música> Hoy día en el desfile hemos representado la morenada, que es un baile de esclavos, pero representa eh, no la esclavitud, sino la libertad. The music comes from um, Bolivia. A lot of it is from like the high up in the mountains that it originated, um, and it's 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 danced all around Bolivia. And they do a festival every year called Carnaval in La Paz through the through the streets. So the dances that we do are all part of that big, huge parade that goes on. <laughs> Hoy San Cruz Club es un programa que tienen, que trabajan de, de después de las escuelas. Entonces, pues dentro de los, pro, de los programas que tienen ahí se les enseña el arte y la cultura, y se les enseña a bailar, a coser sus vestiditos, sus disfraces, ¿verdad?, para que salgan a bailar. Es una cosa muy linda que se pasa con ellos. Y eso lo hacemos con artistas locales del Milwaukee Public Theater, ¿verdad?, que trabaja con nosotros también. Y, que, y con el Conservatorio de Música que enseña a la gente a tocar instrumentos. Entonces, pues, se casa una cosa muy, muy linda para nosotros. This year definitely was a, a lot bigger. We had a lot more floats, a lot more colorful costumes, a lot more music. I think it's growing. I'm really excited to be part of this again next year. I think that um, everybody should come out and watch, and it's just going to get better and better.
creo que estamos muy entusiasmados de lo que pasó este año y bendiciones y el agradecimiento a nuestros patrocinadores y a todos los voluntarios del carnaval. La organización del próximo Carnaval Latino de Milwaukee ya comenzó y si usted cree que su país no fue representado, solo diríjase al comité organizador para que pueda mostrar las tradiciones. I was born in New Mexico. I grew up in Arizona, but I'm of Mexican descent. I grew up drawing all the time. I have drawn since I was really young, and my mom taught me how to draw. I just loved it. I just did it all the time. I think I was really prolific, and so I spent a lot of time just making things. I got my master's degree um, in Arizona, uh, my MFA, which is a Master of Fine Arts in drawing and painting. Falling palindrome is a concept that I came up with um, before I became a Christian, and it was to understand truth through the study of art. I wanted to understand that concept if there was an absolute truth or not. De acuerdo con el Departamento de Homeland Security, existen 575 mil inmigrantes entre las edades de 16 a 30 años que fueron traídos por sus padres a temprana edad y han recibido los beneficios del programa del presidente Obama Acción Diferida. El abogado en inmigración, Joseph Rivas, nos habla sobre este tema. Attorney Rivas, thank you so much for joining us again on Adelante. Well, thank you for the invitation and good evening. Attorney Rivas, uh, we uh, see a lot of excitement, a lot of uh, uh, joy on regards DACA. I know those uh, uh, kids who arrived here at uh, a very young uh, age, and now they are able to have a, a permission for a job, and they have a driver's license. And in Wisconsin, they are enjoying some of the benefits that in other states they cannot. Uh, can you talk about the cases that uh, have uh, given you and those clients of you some satisfaction, some uh, victories? Well, let me go back for those who don't know what DACA means. It's an mm -hmm. acronym for Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Mm -hmm. And these are young children that were brought to the United States by their parents mm -hmm. uh, while they were young. Most of them grew up here have gone to school here and to qualify for DACA you have to have completed uh, your high school education or be in the process of getting your GED mm -hmm. and you have to be brought here before you were 16 years of age and have arrived before June 15th of 2007. So that's a lot of technical stuff that you mm -hmm. have to explain not only to these kids but to their parents mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the parents are, are bringing them to your office and you're counseling and le providing legal advice for these children. Mm -hmm. But it's also kind of interesting because it is also state specific. Even though DACA is a federal program, mm -hmm. uh, not each state can qualify their juveniles as the same way as we do here in, in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And if you do get deferred action for childhood arrivals granted to you, you then can get a social security number, and then in Wisconsin you can get a driver's license. Now, not, now, not all states provide driver's license. Uh, mm -hmm. And for example, uh, I know Arizona does not provide uh, driver's license for their DACA recipients. And I believe Georgia or Alabama is another state where you cannot get a driver's license. Mm -hmm. But the qualifications for DACA, you know, they're qu kind of rigid. Only one felony, three, three misdemeanors or more kicks you out of the program, and even a DUI conviction, mm -hmm. uh, which I find kind of important because uh, in Wisconsin, we have a little quirky law in Wisconsin. If you don't mind, can I talk about that? Of course. Well, this may go back to Wisconsin's history with, uh, with, with the breweries here, what have you. But in Wisconsin, you know, your first drunk driving conviction is actually a traffic matter. And so because it is not a criminal conviction, uh, having a DUI conviction in Wisconsin will not result in a denial for your DACA application. Uh, I have also, and I have had a number of clients where I've represented them and we were able to get them DACA benefits even though they had one DUI. Mm -hmm. And I also had a successful case where I had a client of mine where she had a marijuana conviction, mm -hmm. 25 grams. And there is a threshold, if you have 30 grams or less, that won't stop you to get your green card application. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking about green card. Uh, but this case, uh, she had a 25 
uh, grams of marijuana, and it was processed in her municipal court. Again, not a criminal conviction, and we had to brief this extensively, but we were able to get her DACA benefits. And so this is a benefit where you get work authorization for two years. Uh, you can also, if you have some extenuating circumstances, get authorization to travel outside of the United States. And that's called advanced departure. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that is if you get advanced departure and you leave the country and you come back in, now the last time you enter the United States, you are inspected and allowed to come into the country legally, mm -hmm. which then does open the door for you to get your, your green card in the future because now you have met one of the requirements of having been physically inspected and allowed into the United States. So that program has really been beneficial for a lot of students that are here in the United States. At the end and through your office experience, are you seeing that more uh, uh, people are trusting the program of the president and are applying for it? Have you had enough cases? Are you seeing a national level, um, uh, the people taking advantage on this program? Well, I wouldn't say it's overwhelming our office uh, mm -hmm. because there's many resources for uh, someone to go to. Uh, but I, I would say we have a constant stream. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the best advertising is word of mouth. When you get DACA for, for a student, then they will talk to their friend or a family member. Yep. Now he's bringing his brother in. Uh, he's yeah. bringing his girlfriend in. My attorney is a good lawyer. <laughs> so, yes. You know, yeah, go that's with the best him. That's the exactly. best advertising. For Latinos? Yes. Especially. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that, so that's working out. But it's a constant stream. I wouldn't say... Uh, I, I think some people are still holding out that there's going to be some comprehensive immigration reform. But uh, in Why my... should people uh, uh, apply for DACA even if uh, an immigration reform uh, could be happening? That is mostly no. But why should, why should people believe on using at least the benefits of this program? Well, I, I believe if you get the benefits and you get the driver's license, you're not going to be pulled over now driving without a license because mm -hmm. uh, there's so many other ramifications. Then you're paying all these fines and, and all these tickets, and, and it opens jobs for you. Uh, and so, and most of these kids, you know, are just very well educated, and, and so they just want to contribute to our our society and to our system. That's just that's just yes. good. Attorney Rivas, how can people contact you? Well, today's internet, uh, I would recommend that they look to the website and go to our website of www.hmrvisa.com, or they can call our office at four one four nine six two seven four four zero. Thank you so much for being with us, Rivas. Yes. Y al final de un programa más de adelante, por favor déjenos saber sus comentarios en nuestro teléfono 297-7544 o escríbanos a nuestra dirección de correo electrónico en adelante arroba matc.edu y visítenos en nuestro sitio del internet en mptv.org y en Facebook. Sintonícenos en Milwaukee Public Television, canales 10.1 y 36.2, todos los martes a las 6.30 de la tarde, y en canal 36.1, los miércoles a las 12.30 de la medianoche y los domingos a las 6 de la tarde. Y en MPTV VM 10.3, los viernes a las 6 y 6.30 de la tarde y los domingos a las 8 de la mañana. Soy Patricia Gómez. Gracias por acompañarnos.